Uh, yes. Only water. <clears throat> yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the totally real genocide that definitely happened that the Soviets did to the um, poor Kulaks, the poor Ukraine, um, Ukrainian nationalists. Let's speak for them for a moment, and we're moving on. Uh, <laughs> so yes, today that's what we're going to talk about, how a lot of more of the constant... Um, the um, argument used against communists, particularly the whole tanky or whatever, <laughs> that to use against the Soviet Union. And we're going to talk about how it completely made up. Of course, most of us already know this, but we're going to talk about how it's made up and where it's... Um, what, like, what exactly was fabricated and how the numbers, which is completely off and don't make any sense. Yeah. <sighs> yes, Keish, those poor grain hoarders. You know, we, got, we have to feel bad for those bourgeois, petty bourgeois uh, <laughs> Ukrainians. <laughs> People crying over kulaks gets me every time. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's just always so funny. Yeah. You know? trying to say oh so the kulaks deserve like okay first of all i thought you guys were communists you guys you guys always talking about eat the rich and kill the bourgeois <laughs> petty bourgeois but then you know the soviets do it and everybody's no like, not like oh, that my goodness i can't believe you did that <laughs> make up your mind do you want them dead or not uh <clears throat> uh so this book like, is like, about uh season. douglas toddle uh who spent most of his life in Western Canada, derogatory. Tuttle worked as a photographer and a photo lab technician, a fine artist, underground miner, and as a steel worker. An active trade unionist, Tuttle edited the United S uh, Steelworkers Journal, The Challenger, from 1975 to 1985. Uh, and he got like 20 international and Canadian labor journalism awards. Uh, he worked as a labor history researcher and as an organizer. During the 70s, he assisted the organizing drive of Chicano farm workers in California and worked with native Indian farm workers in Manitoba. Toddle has written various Canadian and U.S. periodicals, magazines, and labor journals. So that's the history of the, uh, the author whose book we're going over today. <clears throat> All right, so before we get into this, it's going to be a lot of numbers, and it's going to be uh, really going over a lot of the history, and, you know, I mean, I find it interesting because I really do enjoy history, but I'm going to be honest with you, I can definitely tell, tell to some people, it's not going to be too much fun, we're going to be talking about Russian agriculture before and after the revolution, and just all around, you know, uh, census populations so get ready <clears throat> all right so to start this off we're going to talk about the kulaks so who are the kulaks the kulak was a term which is used to describe peasants who owned over eight acres of land and hired other peasants to work it so to work it towards the end of the Russian Empire. So that right there already shows a flaw in the definition that is provided by um, I think I got I think I got this um, definition off of uh, Wikipedia. And so that definition already has a flaw in it by calling them peasants. Because if someone has the ability to own eight acres of land or more and hire other peasants to work for them, they're not a peasant. <laughs> they are bourgeois or petty bourgeois at best so that's already already right there showing they need to start lying off the bat they couldn't even just wait to like <laughs> you know start telling them lies he's like you know so anyway wikipedia wikipedia says i know that these um the kulaks are actually peasants we have the ability to hire other peasants to work their land because you know that's what peasants do Yes, the very trusted site, um, Wikipedia, Sarah. That's why I'm <laughs> using them the whole time. <laughs> All debate bros 
Trust Wikipedia, Sarah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm using the uh, Wikipedia source just to get all the, the debate bros and the bros to be like to get to, to um to get them to trust me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Lure them in the sweet, sweet candy. <laughs> me an employee with Trust my own employees <laughs> true <laughs> that's exactly what the vibe is yeah all right so what is it uh, so to continue on what a cloak is it was a class-based slur generated by the bolsheviks which translates to fists implying that they were tight-fisted kulaks came about in 1906 from Stolypin's land reforms Stolypin was a chairman of the Council of Ministers in 1906. What he was trying to do was bring up production of agriculture and bring it to a level of the capitalist nations and modernize the industry. The land reforms was to break up the old way of agriculture, Russian agriculture, which was already collectivized. So when the Bolsheviks came in to collectivize the agriculture, it wasn't like the first time it's ever happened. Russian agriculture was already um, collectivized. It was decollectivized in 1906, and then when the Bolsheviks um, came into power, they recollectivized it. So the land reform um, decollectivized the Russian agriculture industry. So traditional farm, traditional Russian farms were already communal long before the Bolsheviks were around. It was similar to a American homesteading when the um, when Stolypin the Pen put out his land reforms. So uh, it was similar to American homesteading where people would go out and government would just give them land. The thing was that some people had more money and more resources and were able to hack it, whatever, compared to the poorer people who had fewer resources. So the Kulaks were able to collect more and more land, cutting out the actual peasants in the area. So yes, that's basically a um, rundown on who the Kulaks are. They're just basically who took it, people who had already, you know, more resources of you know, poor peasants in Ukraine and in Russia well, and all across the Soviet Union, um, and they took advantage of the poor, they took advantage of the poor peasants because they, you know, they didn't have anything to actually work the land. So in 1928, three quarters of the land was sown by hand. And then 28 is about when the collectivization started. So, yeah, it's three quarters, 75% of the land was sown by hand. A third of the crops was still reaped by sickle and scythe. And um, a quarter of the households had no draft animals. Draft animals are what stuff that pulls um, stuff like plows to actually get it going. And only half of them had plows anyway. So, at this point on farming, for the most part, was still done by hand. So this just shows the backwards um, nature and uh, of the, how Russian agriculture worked in the Russia before the Bolsheviks took over, because it shows how all these people, these most of the people, did not have the ability to actually properly work these farms. They do not have the ability to work these farms on mass and get to feed everybody while the Kulaks they they did. They had to, they had um draft animals, they had um plows, they had multiple people working for them. <clears throat> okay. So 4% of the population, the Kulaks, owned 15% of the area under crop. And in doing so, they're able to accumulate money. And what they would um, so is buy better equipment and lease it to the poorer peasants. So it's just another way for uh, the Kulaks to take advantage of the peasants in the area. So... In or- so, in order for the peasants to keep up with the kulaks, they needed these equipments 
they needed the equipment to actually you know keep up with them so they would um they would they would lease the the Kulix would lease the equipment to the peasants which would put the peasants even to more debt with them further enriching the Kulix so already right there you know you just have more and more reason to hate these guys and not willing to trust what they have to say about the evil uh Soviets collectivizing and uh, collectivizing the um, um, area, collectivizing the Soviet Union, and moving actually socialist forward because there's no way a Kulak or a capitalist would have a objective, a pro opinion of them losing their capital. Um, so, Avenging Pineapple, as if you get your way, what will you do with the capitalists? Um, if they don't, you know, try to destroy, you know, they, don't, they don't, you know, engage in counter-revolution, nothing. No need to kill people, necessarily. Yeah, they can uh, just give up their shit for the collective and um, become a you know, one of the rest of everyone else. Productive labor. Yeah. You know, productive members of society. I mean, I mean of course, if they act- actively try to destroy the revolution, then fucking die. <laughs> In a video <laughs> game, obviously. Video game, my crap, of course. Everything I say is a hypothetical and fake, so. <laughs> Just like the genocide of Holodomor. <laughs> Just like the. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> so at this point in the late 20s when the recollectivization was undergoing the industrialization in the USSR was already full steam ahead and all the major cities was under communist control but 82% of the Russian population was peasant and there was almost no party presence in the rural areas at all collectivized agriculture in the beginning are you going to say something? Uh, well, that will become violent. Like, yeah, I mean, we're we're aware. Um, we will definitely tell you that here. Yes, that will that will would be violent. But we already live under a um, society that has uh, acceptable violence already, such as uh, houselessness and. Um, you know starvation and uh, police brutality all of these right things are uh, tolerable for everyone now and they exist and they are violent um, so yeah that we're already living under a system that allows violence and actually needs violence to continue through imperialism and uh, you know just police violence in general so yeah Mm -hmm. (sighs) all right so collectivized agriculture in the beginning brought in about 500,000 tons of wheat to market the kulaks brought in 2.13 million tons of wheat this was the point already when the USSR was threatened with war by the UK. If you didn't know, the UK did um, threaten war to the USSR. I don't think I've ever uh, heard about it until I started to learn more about Soviet history, which, of course, why would they tell us everything if it doesn't, you know, serve a narrative? So. Bukharin, at this time, was Stalin's main ally in the leadership and stresses the importance of advancing socialism using market reforms. Bukharin was a social democrat, if you didn't know, and he was an old Bolshevik, so it really does go into later when people try to say, oh, Stalin killed the old Bolsheviks, he's killing the communists for that. Not all the Bolsheviks were actually communists. A lot of people don't realize that. Not all of the Bolsheviks were actual communists, Bukharin being one of them. And it also implies that people like Berea and uh, Khrushchev were communists. And no, they weren't. So um, Bukharin 
because in 1925 he called for the peasant to enrich themselves which is basically just another way of saying pull yourselves up by your bootstraps so <laughs> this is somebody that people uh, yeah a lot of uh, libertarian communists especially or communists try to say <clears throat> that oh I believe yeah Bukharin was um, executed by the Soviet Union I believe, I believe so and they try to use it as oh Bukharin he was a real communist and oh someone was killed him to you know consolidate power and but no this dude was telling people to pull themselves by their bootstraps that is not a uh, um, communist rhetoric and Stalin even responded to this in a letter saying the slogan enrich yourself is not ours it is wrong our slogan is socialist accumulation and uh, this was pretty much the beginning of the split in the Bolsheviks which later led to what we know as the purges in 1927 and 28 the grain harvest was about 4 million tons less than in 26 due to drought the Kulaks took advantage of this by hoarding the grain and selling it at 300% markup. As a result, the city started to starve because the Soviet government can't afford to buy enough grain to support the rapidly industrializing centers of the Soviet Union. In January 1928, the Politburo unanimously decided to take exceptional measures by seizing wheat from the Kulaks and the well-to-do peasants to avoid famine in the cities. Stalin said in October, worker discontent was increasing. There are people in the ranks of our party who are striving, perhaps without themselves realizing it, to adapt our socialist construction to the tastes and needs of the Soviet bourgeoisie. If you take away their billions, they'll put up a fight. They'll be able to pull fortunes and use to use buying and helping of the armed Trumpsters, the left would have to show backbone to fight them, which won't happen. You really think that the left will win a shooting war um, when they can not stand up to McConnell? Well, um, I'm going to tell you that the left are not really going against McConnell right now. Like, you have... Um, uh, right and center right in uh, power right now. Uh, the Democrats uh, are not yeah, the Democrats are left. not left, so. Um, and yeah, uh, right now uh, it's not, I mean, we're not accelerationists. We're not saying that we need to do it right now because obviously you're right. Uh, that analysis is correct at this moment. Um, it would, it like nothing, it would happen, you know, nothing would happen. Um, yeah. So yeah, we don't, we're yeah, not ready. Just, we're uh, not at a so position be... for this conversation, no. you know, yeah. right now we're yeah, trying that, to make more just, communists. Uh, adventurism. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're making more communists. We are um, teaching what we need to know. And that's what our job is right now, you know, making more communists and, uh, raising class consciousness in our areas and where we can. Mm -hmm. So Stalin had all the kulaks killed and then everyone starved even more. Okay. Well, you're a silly goose. I'm actually, we're going over that like right it's now funny because they actually <laughs> didn't do that. Yeah. They just, which I was actually was just, the paragraph I'm about to go over is literally <laughs> just saying that they didn't do that. <laughs> okay, so listen up, folks. All right, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Kulaks would be what Stalin was referencing as the Soviet bourgeoisie is a terrible contradiction because we have the USSR who was just barely starting out and the drought set, set, setting them so far back. All right, so they, you know, they finally be able to. You know, they won, they got their country, uh, the Soviets, uh, the U.S. Sorry, just but they started out, and then a drought hits them. So, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not, a, you know, a good start for them. Of course, it's not like they can control the weather. But the Soviets did not go out and immediately start murdering the Kulaks in the streets and taking their stuff away and saying, this is ours now. They attempted at a peaceful relationship and keep this mixed economy. 
but by doing so, they allowed the manipulation of the markets to occur. So the very fact that they didn't kill the coup, actually they didn't do the things that you try to claim that they do, was the very reason why the QLX were able to get um, manipulate right. the market in a way to actually build up. So, so because, because they actually didn't kill all the kulaks, it became a, a, yeah. a reactionary problem. Yeah, it did become a problem. But they say, I'm a tanky, I'm, I'm a tanky, yeah, I'm a tanky, yeah, yeah, I'm a tanky. We're riding that tank, We're mowing down, down tank. the fucking mowing snowflakes. The snowflakes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that just went off. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yeah. So yeah, take that uh, you know, and think about it, um, and just roll it around in your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you always see in these situations of something bad happening, and it's sort of just because the communists were like, you know what, let's just let them, be, you know, let them be around. Let's not take authoritarian, you know, let's not take crazy authoritarian measures that is overreaching. We should let people, you know, speak their um, minds so they could be proven wrong. And then it, it does you know, hit them back in the face and it hurts them in the long run. But at the end, but even then, people would get onto Twitter 50 years later, 60 years later, saying, oh my God, they were so authoritarian, they didn't allow anyone to speak. No. They allowed people to speak, and that was the problem. They allowed people, to, they allowed the Kulaks to do their thing, and that was the problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that was infrared, but we are not a fan of infrared, like, at all. We, we just find him very, he's a spectacle, and we enjoy it. So, yes, that's what's happening with that. <laughs> Yeah, we don't know. Uh, we don't like. Um, it's just it's a it's a whole comedy thing. It's it's entertainment purposes. Yeah, it makes us laugh, honestly. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, every now and then he gets shared into a, a group chat. We just laugh at it because it's hilarious. It's the way he just starts yelling. Ah! <laughs> I wonder I just what it feels okay, so like to be your chest on camera. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Kulaks. Wait, who said that? No, me. I was just thinking that because that's what he does. Uh, he like does the the King Kong like uh, chest beating <laughs> thing. And it just seems invigorating. That's weird. <laughs> that's. <sighs> I don't know how. I mean. At this point, it can't be a bit. It has to be who he seriously is. But I don't know how someone like that could live in the world. <laughs> I don't know how he can. Yeah. Well, we it saw just, him on a date. He was really weird. People. It was. It was as weird as you. It. We thought it was going to be. <laughs> mm. Haas is a fascist and only ever talks about social positions that would align with the GOP. You're right. You're right. You're 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 right. And people try to give him like, you know, they say, oh, he's just socially conservative. But socially conservative means you're fucking bigot. OK, that's just what that means. <laughs> so that's where we stand there. Yeah. And yeah, somebody else brought it up in uh, the comments with the talking about how representatives were sent to the Kulaks. And yes, I'm also going to go over that one. <clears throat> but a bit later. So, okay, so the Kulaks were bourgeois or petty bourgeois at best, unlike the, what anti communists and um, anarchists would have you believe by trying to claim that they were a collective of peasants fighting the evil Soviets. They were allowed to live in the Soviet Union and do their harm, even though it hurt the Soviet Union. In the years of 28 and 29, the government has to ration bread, sugar, tea and meat so this is when they start the recollectivization efforts in the beginning they don't involve the kulaks in this it is directed as the peasants if the peasants got together and started the collective farm the government will give you money grain and machines they had tractor stations so the, pe the peasants would have to buy one and go into debt <laughs> bless you thank you they just borrowed the tractors to till the land and returned it when they were done. So, you know, how you see, you know, um, all these 
um, farmers in, in America today would be individually each have their own machines and they have to fix them themselves and if they're broken they have to you know shell out a lot of money to do it and they said that's all individualistic here they had you know um, tractor uh, let me see the list Ooh, tractor stations which meant you didn't have your own tractor you just went out to the tractor station and just grabbed it when you need one and then you returned it when you're done that's so cool Mm -hmm. I just love that. Yep. And then the state would, you know, constantly monitor the the tractors to make sure that they're, you know, still working. So, you know, you never have to worry about that. And the Kulaks also had a relationship with the church. The church was spreading misinformation about the collective farms, telling people they would have to share their children, their wives would be sold to China... Oh, my God. And everyone slept under a huge blanket. Shut up. Did They did not say that they slept under a huge they did. blanket. They did? They did. No! They did. That's also where the toothbrush Shut thing up. comes from. No, I didn't it know happened. they actually did I it. I didn't include it because I was... It happened, yes. Ah! I didn't include it because I was thinking... Uh, would this really relate to a lot more? And I'm already you know, adding a lot of stuff in the first place. So I cut that <clears> part out, actually. That is so funny. Oh, my God. But I'm glad you um, put it in in Grumpsafrino. Yeah, Grumpsafrino is awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they don't have the right to repair um, the, the most of the machines because they have to be repaired by a specialist. Yeah, I and that is... I know that, so. That is a, a, another way. Yeah, it, it's the same thing with the McDonald's ice, ice uh, cream machines, right? That's why they can't get fixed is because there's only one factor one place that's allowed to fix them right? and that's just a way to, mm -hmm. to make money you know it's just and capitalism is efficient uh, but it's efficient mm -hmm. in how to pull out the most money from people not in like e yeah. efficiency as in what's best for everyone <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean just imagine you know you know you work on a farm or whatever and you need a tractor but instead of going into debt spending however amount of money and you know not even being able to fix it up yourself if it breaks you just go get, grab one of the community tractors till your farm and then bring it right back and then the people who run the tractor um ports i keep on forgetting the word jesus um the tractor stations the people who run those did, you know, upkeep the tractors. They'll make sure that they're still in working order. <clears throat> so in nineteen twenty nine, the collective agriculture produced two point two million tons of wheat. Alright, so just keep in mind in twenty eight, I mean twenty eight, they were producing practically nothing. They were producing practically um, nothing. I believe it was like 500,000 tons. And then 29, the collective agriculture produced 2.2 million tons. In 1930, the collective farms produced 6.2 million tons to cities. Now the Kulaks are getting worried. Not because they were being suppressed, you know, because, you know, all oh, the Soviets were, you know, killing them and destroying their farms, whatever, but because the collective worked better rather than the exploitative capitalist work. They were it was showing that, you know, the um, peasants coming together, working as a collective on these farms, was producing more and more grain. And the Kulak's way of life was so slowly diminishing. <laughs> so on January 1st, 1930, all right, to show how much, how many people in collective farms went up. And so on January 1st, 1930, 18% of the peasant families were members of collective farms. And only one month later, that number jumped to 31.1%. It was heavily youth-led, like in China during the, China, the, during the Cultural Revolution. As, as, as of all, there were excesses, because, you know, um, youths like I, we tend to, you know, have... Can't you, you, you know, the second, you know, you go out there, you can't really control yourself. I forgot the word. Uh, 
uh, you, you, you really can't stop yourself. For a second, you start to get going, you just continue going until you're actually stopped. So, yeah, there were excesses. Yeah, a student who was working there told a U.S. traveler, um, this was a war and is a war. The Kulik had to be got out of the way completely as an enemy of the front. He is the enemy of the collective farm to the Cocos. So at this point, they were getting into an antagonistic relationship with the Kulaks, and it had nothing to do with the government. The government was not um, provoking any kind of antagonisms. They weren't saying to the peasants to go out and start fighting the Kulaks. It's government was just, you know, hey, listen, we're just going to help the um, peasants, you know, build up their collective farms, but we give let the Kulaks do what they want to do. So, but because of this, um, raising of a, pro- a proletarian well, peasants among peasants you know um, raising their unity among each other they saw the <clears throat> how the kulaks stood in the way of them being truly liberated and how the kulaks were just ah oh, crap the just, you know, the, the oppressed. The were oppressing these people for so long, and they did not know how there could be a another way of life until when so Bolsheviks came to power. They started um, the recollectivization programs. I just want to say thank you so much to Pick Okra, who has been gifting uh, subs in the chat to Lazy Pajamas and Grom Storino. That means a lot to us. Thank you so much. Okay. And thanks for following. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Susie asked, how can anyone see this and think it's authoritarian? It doesn't make sense having everyone getting one tractor. Well, because it could be seen as a way that you're not allowed to have your own tractor. The state owns the tractor. The state is controlling the tractor. I need my tractor at my house. Mm-hmm. It's not, I don't have true freedoms unless I have my own personal tractor. Everyone knows this. <laughs> it's silly. I can't even imagine, like, ugh, like I, I don't know. It just sounds so fucking silly to me, all of these arguments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, choice, I'm not, you know, getting directly out the book. I wrote it down on Doc, so I didn't really put any um, page numbers down. <laughs> what page are we on? Yeah, my gun's in tractor. All right. <clears throat> so now the Kulik start to fight with the peasants, and to they start to murder the leaders of the collective farms. Okay, so, so the who was point, doing that? Was it the Kulaks the that were Kulaks. doing it? The wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you don't even use garages. You don't even use tractors most of the year, so why have one? Why have a personal tractor that, you know, I'm only going to use? At least just send it out to the community. And there, guess what? Now everybody has a tractor. Right? Instead of five people buying five tractors, there's five people in one tractor. You use it, the next person uses it, the next person uses it, and so on and so far. Yeah, we can just do a tractor schedule. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe that was also part of it. There was a kind of schedule thing. And the thing is with that, I'm going to go on a tangent here. It was revoked under Khrushchev. Oh, fucking Khrushchev. That went under the way. He's a yeah, that went away under him. <clears throat> You're right, Susie. It just creates more trash. We don't need to do that. And even creating those things, you know, that burns like fossil fuels, I'm sure, which fucks mm-hmm. up the environment. So making less is better. Yep. And it's even better, you know, when it's not just one person working the farm. No, the guy who ate the uh, at Pizza Hut was Gorbachev. Fucking he sucks Gorbachev. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I ratioed him on Twitter. I was so proud of him. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's cool. It was a picture of Stalin. <laughs> 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 so 
socialism is when Pizza Hut. True. But only with stuffed crust. Mm. All right. <clears throat> exactly. So, Sean. yes, the Kulaks are the one who started the violence. They started killing the um, leaders of the collective farms. So at this point, that's when, you know, when the Kulaks started, the f- they started at first. That's when the government came in like, okay, well, we're going to have to put an end to this. So they started going in and grabbed the Kulaks lands and distributed it to the collective farms. So they're like, all right, listen, we're going to put an end to this. So we're going to just completely put an end to this. It's just over now. We entertained you guys running around enough. However... The Kulaks not only kill the people who try to do so, they, so when the people when they sent Soviets down to um, redistribute the land, the Kulaks are killing them. And then, but they also sabotage their own land. In 1933, when this was happening, the Kulaks slaughtered their own cattle and horses. They burned their own crops. So here are the numbers to them. But they say I'm a tanky, oh, I'm, I'm a tanky, tanky. yeah I'm a tanky, <laughs> yeah I'm a tanky. We're right in that tank, mowing down the fucking snowflakes. Okay, you're good. Yeah, my dude, this is sight satire. <laughs> Do we have f- uh, four or four more emote slots open right now? I think I'm gonna like make them. Uh, right now. I think we have like. But they say I'm a tanky. Oh, I'm a okay. tanky. Yeah, I'm a I'm tanky. Do... Yeah, I'm a tanky. We're riding that tank, okay, mowing down the fucking snowflakes. It's not a Holocaust denial channel. We know the Holocaust did happen. It was horrible. What the hell? Talking about. Um, surprise Pika, maybe, as an emote? Or the guy who says, yeah, and, like, looks really sad. Yeah. And then, or, uh, so much unread communist literature guy. Do you know the face? The, so much unread communist. Yeah. Oh, I like that one. Let's do that one. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> and then maybe yeah, no, we do the, an the ice pick one? And... I don't know. Yes, absolutely. We have to get that anti trust key thing in there, just so <clears throat> Hayes can't get comfortable. <laughs> okay, cool. Those, I'm going to work on that right now, actually, while we're talking. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to also, I guess, take another tangent here. Um, I was going to add it in, but I just completely forgot to. But the reason why it's called Holodomor is because the Ukrainian nationalists and uh, Ukrainian fascists were... Um, Kind of trying to minimize the Holocaust itself. That's why they call it a lot of one. They're trying to say, look, this is the same thing. Why is which one worse than the other? Because one actually happened, the other one didn't. So that's why it's called a lot of more. So it's meant to intentionally minimize the effects of the Holocaust. So a lot more is already anti anti Semitic. Just calling it a lot of more is has anti Semitic roots. Stop calling me out. I still need to finish Lennon. No, we're going to continue calling out until you're done. Finish. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so here are the numbers and get ready. So, the number of horses. Alright, so this is when the Kulaks start um, sabotaging their own land and killing their own cattle. So the horses go from 30 million to 15 million. <laughs> Cattle goes from seventy million to thirty-eight million. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sheep and goats go from one hundred forty-seven million to fifty million. Hogs go from twenty million to twelve million. And so, before anyone tries to say that I am using, you know, Soviet statistics to use as propaganda against the Kulaks, like, oh, you know, you're just getting this from this. Um, Authoritarian Soviet, um, so um, Soviet dictatorship, right? They're trying to intentionally. They're saying all these numbers. Well, actually, is this a statistic study about Frederick Schumann, who was a Williams College professor of government that was traveling to Ukraine at the time? All right, so it's not even Soviet statistics. It's from some guy who's probably pro-capitalism, you know, working as a professor in America, so.
Yeah, also at the same time, yeah, during, um, I believe, when they try to pass off as a lot of more, I, I believe this, um, the leader of uh, Ukraine in the Soviet Union was Jewish. So, and he, Ukraine was extremely, there's a lot of parts of Ukraine that was extremely fascist and nationalistic, so they did not like that at all. Because, you know, they tried to, you know, said that as, see, look at that, the um, Jewish government is taking over, which is, you know, what they said. I don't know who Chris Hayes is. I still don't know. Chris Hayes is uh, like a lib on like NBC or MSNB, MSDNC, one of those. Well, I'm glad I don't know him. <laughs> okay, so yeah, like Professor Zhao Arvalo, I hope I said that correctly. I doubt I did. If a body goes into a horizontal axis in a Soviet territory, that's one more for the communist victim count. Yeah, they they just added numbers to whoever they... Um, Took an account to during World War Two when the Red Army died, when the, when our Red Army soldiers died, they counted those as victims of communism. When Nazi soldiers um, killed um, civilians, they counted as victims of communism. They count um, the Nazis who were killed as victims of communism. Uh, they count the fact that hey, you know what? Guess what? Guess what, guess what happens when there's a war, guys? People don't give birth. They don't have children. It happens. Because guess what? Everybody's in a war. Nobody wants to have a children during this time. So birth rates go down. And they count that as a, another thing, a victim of communism. <laughs> they also, I believe they also counted um, car crash victims. And, <laughs> and they also counted in uh, when um, America invaded Vietnam, they counted anyone who, anyone who died there as victims of communism. And yeah, they are currently counting um, corona victims as victims of communism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That's rude. That's just rude. Stalin ran over <laughs> everyone with his car. That would be hilarious. <laughs> uh, shit. <laughs> What? If they falsified so many victims of communism, why deny the political genocide in Ukraine? Who, who's denying what? Wait, what? <laughs> who's denying what? Lobby one three one eight. They, if they falsified so many victims, yeah, in the chat. No, I see. I just don't know um, what they're saying. Yeah. Like who? Who is denying which? What? I have no idea what the person is implying. <sighs> is this like a? I don't know. So okay. So if the victims of communism are mostly falsified, why would they need to bicker about if? Uh, Holodor Holodomor victims deserved it because we're saying that it didn't happen. There were no Holodomor victims. That's the whole point. And the stuff that people that did die in that time, it was because the Kuleks, the um, <clears throat> capitalist class who was fighting the Soviet government, killed people. And because since they actually destroyed their own crops and cattle, it did lead to, you know, uh, kind of a famine because they burned their own crops and killed their own cattle. So it's not because oh, the Soviets did it. It's not because the Soviets, you know, um, put down some harsh punishments under the um, Ukrainians. It's just who likes it to themselves. 
<laughs> I don't know what exactly you expect the Soviets to do about that. <laughs> Soviet Union should have stopped them. <laughs> no, that's authoritarian. <laughs> so you should sort have of gone back in time and, made, and <laughs> prevented the um, Kulaks from destroying their own crop and cattle. Okay, so um, the men's man says, my grandmother's landlord actually personally witnessed Stalin personally eating all the grain in Ukraine. <laughs> I have a I have a video that I need. I might have sent it to you, Sal. It's hilarious because it's not real, obviously. But it's a um, kind of like a video of someone changing um, the translation of what Stalin is saying to bragging about eating all the grain in Ukraine. Oh my Let's god, I love find that. Find it real quick. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna send it to you. So, oh, found it. Cool. I'm gonna just send it to you real quick so you can put it up on there. Over Skype, or where? No, I'm gonna just send it to you, um, to to uh, Twitter. Okay. So you can. Second, it loads. There we go. Mm. Well, now mine's not loading. <laughs> My internet is terrible, so it's probably taking forever for it to actually send. Okay. Oh, here it goes. Oh, there it goes. This is so funny. Okay. Uh, they gotta move. Hold on, hold on, I gotta share the screen with you. Wait there, okay. <laughs> share. That shit was funny as hell though. Okay, you can see now too. Comrades, I have just returned from cool. eating all the grain in Ukraine. <laughs> As such, the Central Committee has directed Comrade Khrushchev to begin market reform. <laughs> These reforms will shift the responsibility of starvation from me to the invisible hand. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a betrayal of socialism, but rather a return to the spirit of socialism. <laughs> read it. Read that. <laughs> As Mark says, it doesn't matter if the the cat is black or white, so long as it starves a billion Ukrainians. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! <laughs> uh, that was cute. Okay. <laughs> oh, you know what else I want to show you is I just finished this meme. Actually, here. Can you see? Oh, shoot, not that one. Do you see it, Reggie? Yeah, I see it. Okay. I really do like it. So this is one of the memes, or uh, the emotes that I'm going to do, which this is from this right here. And so, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was thinking about, do we like this? Is this cute? I think that's really cute. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do know. like it. It's pretty cool. Okay. So that's what I'm working on. Okay. You just, you know, put it every, every time someone says something good about Sharansky. Yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can put it into Discord later. And I don't know if it's on YouTube. I found it on Twitter. Best thing I found. And, you know, I like just sharing it every time. Just, you know, just to be a troll every now and then. Because trolling is fun. Trolling is fun. So let's actually continue. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this is what laid the groundwork for the actual famine that happened in the result of the Kulak Civil War. So more more than weather, and certainly more than a communist supposedly intentionally starving the Ukrainian population. A quote from the professor that I uh, cited earlier. So although it was certainly initiated and endorsed to a great extent of ad hoc policies responses to the wild initiatives of regional and rural party and government organized classification and collective farming were shaped less by Stalin and central authority than by irresponsible activities of rural officials. The experimentation of the collective farm leaders left to fend for themselves in the realities of rural countryside. So, in 1930, there weren't even half a million communists among a population of 120 million people. So they were vastly outnumbered. It had almost no support from the government. So that was how, you know, that's how it was going through all the time. And when the Kulaks were, you know, going, yeah, um, when the antagonization between the peasants and the Kulaks finally had reached its peak, that's when the Soviets finally stepped in and sent in 25,000 party members but many were beaten or killed. But despite all that, they were able to bring stability, and by 1930, collectivization was extremely successful. I just so, love, like, this, they, they said, Holodomor stands as the warning to all the dangers of totalitarian power. Like, how do you come in here and say with your whole chest a lie? Huh? Like... Mm-hmm. God damn, what does it feel like to be you? What does it feel like <laughs> to be a fucking dumbass? <laughs> Luckily, I won't ever know. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, continue. Sorry. Let's go. So, it's hilarious that when I'm talking about the stuff, a lot of stuff that happens in chat, it just so happens to be the exact moment where I'm just about to go over the thing. <laughs> Say, uh, so, in this area, when they talk about the evil Stalin, well, this is what they did, did in the area after they finally had successfully collectivized the uh, area so people could get food. You know, how evil and authoritarian it is to make sure everybody is fed. I know, I'm so sorry. But he did, he did, he made that happen. So, And then not only that, he had to go a step further and intensify literacy, literacy programs and build libraries, enrolling children into schools, encouraging political work among women by providing public daycares and public kitchens to take a load off of them. And he also put in cinemas to the countryside and telephone and mail services. I mean, can you believe that evil Stalin, the evil Soviet government, they provided all these services. It's all just to control the people. Trust me. All this stuff sounds good, but you know, I'd rather die on the street with nothing then be provided with everything because it, you know, that's how I'm truly free. Bring stability. I, uh, I think I might have um, said it weird there. I didn't say stability, I said stability. Did you say sterility? Wow. Mm hmm. <clears throat> you 
Yeah, I mean, Soviet Union was so good. They had um, GTA 6 before us. It's absolutely insane. <laughs> <laughs> I love that people, like, do the cell phone thing when... We're like you. You said from your cell phone, like that's a cap, like a product of capitalism. Mm-hmm. When it's not, it was not. Yeah, um, the Soviet, you know, the countries in the Soviet Union after the collapse it was definitely you could describe it as a. <clears throat> oh, that was authoritarian. It was a, a fascist, if you want to call it, because there was supreme, extreme repression of all leftists and communists inside the Soviet Union who want to keep the Soviet Union in place. Uh, yeah, so the Soviet Union is still popular. Actually, a lot of people do want it to bring it back. It's never going to happen. Not unless there's a, another revolution. You're not, sh- not going to vote in the Soviet Union again. Sorry. Not sorry. But until, you know, there is a vanguard in those same countries, it's just not going to be around until it is. Hold on, I'm just trying to look at something right now. Why did the Soviet Union create so much more scientific advancements in the West in their short history? Because they didn't make it hard to do so. They didn't Fucking have by like, um, basically class restrictions or monetary restrictions to be able to do so. Because guess what? Not everybody would be able to go to college. Not everybody has been able to go to um, get the proper education to be able to actually further their, you know, if they're really into sci- science or whatever. Um, the but they come from a poor family, a poor background, they're not going to be able to actually further it. And the reason why the Soviet Union did so good is because they actually, you know, provided education to kids, to, you know, um, young adults, so they could further who they are. Yep, it's just a good way, which, you know, is <clears throat> really cool because they actually, um, another thing the Soviet Union did was they provided uh, stipends for students so they didn't have to work. They were quietly, you know, in the Soviet Union, you, you'd get paid to go to school. Instead of how in America, where you are going to debt to go to school. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, we, we talk about the Soviet Union here so we could feel sad that we didn't live in there. <laughs> Truly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so yes, they intensified the literacy programs and libraries, and I just want to go over how the way that they helped you know a woman bring bring them into more political work for women. They did this by you know providing public daycares and public kitchens. Because you know how you know think about how it's done here in the U.S. How is it done? It's not done. It just you know now they say um, women are paid the same and you can't you can't um hire or or hire someone based on um sex gender which is okay but it, it doesn't really help women in a way because i think they a lot of this stuff gets in the way for example children children if the child is not being able to take care of the, if the mother cannot afford daycare or someone a center to watch them guess what they're not going to be able to 
work as hard as they can because yes, someone needs to watch the kid and it's probably going to be them. They need to be able to cook for the children. So if they take away the those burdens, if you take away their um, needing to watch the kid because there is a public daycare, if they take away the needing to cost, um, make sure to prepare food for the kid because there's a public kitchen, it's a lot easier for women to actually get into the political work and actually have a the actual um, you know, work, you know, they can actually, you know, be this exact same level as a guy in a working machine. Because, you know, guess what? Guys don't really as have to a, worry about uh, that as much. It's just automatically assumed. As a mother, um, yeah, like, uh, it's a fucking mortgage to put your child mm. in daycare. So many people are not able to afford two mortgages. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. like many families cannot mm -hmm. do that. So, yeah, it's, it's it's hard not having these things. So continue. Okay, so in 1930, there was an exceptional harvest of 83.5 million tons. And in 31 and 32 which is when the supposed genocide took place, it dropped to 69.5 and 69.9, um, which, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that, you know, a huge of a um, drop. It's not like you know, they were starving out in the street. But there was definitely, you know, a dip in the, um, in the harvest of the 31 and 32. But from 33 to 35, they were averaging 90 million tons of grain into the cities. And this is the year where the person I'm going to be talking about, Thomas Walker, was actually in the Soviet Union during one of their highest crop yields. So if there even was a genocide, if there was a genocide against the Ukrainians, he wasn't even in... Soviet Union during the time he says it took place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, um, there isn't really any unbiased source. All sources are going to have definitely a, a leaning and a bias to it. You can definitely um, learn how to read through the biases, le learn to read who these people, who they're leaning towards and what is their agenda. But there, I don't think there's really a way where you can get to a place where everybody's just absolutely unbiased because you, you are going to favor a side more than the other. And that's okay, because, okay, uh, so you know, we time, right now are, are biased yeah. towards communism, obviously. <laughs> and that that's okay. Yeah. But w as long as you can figure that out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hope we're pretty clear so with you So I just want to say, <clears throat> I wrote a lot of crap down. And I say a lot. <laughs> we're still at the beginning. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's cool. No, it's definitely good to um, definitely every now and then break break away from what I've written down because it's a, a lot of... It's, it's really heavy. It's, also, it's just a lot of... Um, just, um, yeah, um, critical stuff that just, hey, you know what, every now you need to take a break from it to, you know, not fry your brain. Oh, shit. Okay, so at the time, the USSR had a manpower shortage. It would be ridiculous to kill half of the Ukrainian population. So, this thing about it, you know, every time people just try to, you know, I mean, you could easily just use that every time someone tries to say that Stalin did about Holodomor or whatever. You could just say that sentence just right there. At the time, the USSR had a manpower shortage. It would be ridiculous to kill half the Ukrainian population. And then not only that, to go on and win World War II? Come on. Don't be an idiot. 
So Dr. Hans Blumfeld, who worked as an architect in the Ukraine in 1933, said he saw no corpses or people starving in the street. The only person he saw with a swollen belly was a child waiting to see a doctor, he said. But there was an outbreak of typhoid fever and dysentery at the time Japan had seized Manchuria. And Hitler is in the process of taking power in Germany, and it's well known that from the beginning that the Soviet Union was going to be attacked in Mein Kampf. Hitler even said that Ukraine was essential to its establishment of the Thousand Year Reich. So, the very fact that they would do anything to inhibit their chances of survival is completely ridiculous and stupid. And I guess that goes for all anti communist propaganda. This just hinges on, oh, this thing is true, and this is what I say it is, but when you really think about it, it's a really stupid thing, because why would they? Would all of this be posted into Discord? You know what? I think I can. It's a just see if. Oh, do you you want yeah, Reggie's okay, so notes it's, it's or yeah, it's a book? Yeah. Yeah, it's a book. But yeah, I can definitely put my notes in the Discord. See if I could. I don't know how to. Yeah, I can definitely see it. I can try to put my notes. And then, of course, the, the book is um, Fraud, Famine, and Fascism by Douglas Tottle. I can put a link right here to the book. There you go. Okay, so the notes would be cool. Yeah, I'm going to go to see. Oh, then, um, uh, good night. And... Yeah, there was definitely um, some stuff I didn't put in the notes that because I thought, you know, this is already take this is going to take a long time and there's no need to add any filler stuff. But so my notes is not going to be 100 percent complete. And but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely see if you it looks like you guys do want it. So yeah, I'm gonna definitely gonna put my notes into the um, Discord when it's when we are, are over. Okay, so the government in 1933 huges. Uh, is supposedly starving. This government in 1933, who was supposedly starving their own people, even though you know it was the Kulaks who was um, sabotaging them, they sent 35 million seed pods, foodstuffs, and thousands of tractors and um, combines to Ukraine uh, to counteract the famine in Ukraine. So. This government, who's you, you know, you're, you're trying to convince me, is starving their own people. Sent 35 million seed pods, who stuff and thousands of tractors and combines to Ukraine. That doesn't really seem like they're starving the people. It seems like they're trying to prevent or minimize the famine. It doesn't really seem like a government who's out to kill the people. Okay, our unread one is up and ready, waiting for approval. <coughs> you put a new emote? Yes. Yep. It's not ready I'm yet. It has to get approved. That's the only thing that have. Oh, okay. Um, Let's get approved. Make sure we're okay. not putting any communist things. They actually will not approve uh, like blatantly communist things. It's really shitty. <laughs> it's <laughs> funny because I've seen like Stalin emotes. So, um, yeah, but they have to hide that like cleverly. Um, or if you like, Rob uh, Rousseau has a whole bunch of good ones because he was verified. He got verified, so he was allowed to put whatever without having to get them approved. <laughs> for special privileges for the cool people. <laughs> Get us verified, guys. Do it. I don't know how you can do it, but just do it. <laughs> <laughs> we want Stalin emojis. Yeah, see, check Gromsterinos. Uh, I love that. Nice. 
Yeah, cleverly described or uh, hidden. Described. What did I say that for? Jesus. Okay. You may continue now. Mm -hmm. All right. So, five million Ukrainians fought in the Red Army in World War II out of a population of 25 million. So if you were taking an account that 20 million were exterminated, how does that make, how does that make sense? <laughs> if your opinions by that, by that logic should be gone. They shouldn't be around anymore. I mean, it's just... You know, I, of course, did used to believe it as I was making my journey. I was like, oh, you know, Stalin, Soviet Union was evil. But then, you know, I actually looked into the numbers and seeing how you're supposedly working out. Just like, that doesn't make any sense. There's no. Okay. <clears throat> so, Thomas Walker. We're going to go on about him for a while. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy who is. Thomas Walker is the guy who started this. Right? He created the whole lot of things. So, of course, he's very important to the story. And. Yeah, let's just get on to it before I just continue what I'm going to talk about later anyway. So Thomas Walker entered the USSR in the fall of 1934. He spent less than a week in Moscow and spent the remainder of his 13-day visit in transit to the Manchurian border. Four months later, on February 18th, 1935, a series of articles began in the Hearst Press by Thomas Walker, a so-called noted journalist, traveler, and student of Russian affairs, who has spent several years showing the Union of Soviet Russia, which is, of course, as we know, he was only there for less, um, maybe two weeks, right? So there's already a flaw in that itself. Immediately, it's actually just immediately, it's just going to erase what he said because he claimed to be there for several years, even though he was only there for a little less than two weeks. And he was never really in Ukraine and all that much. He was just in Moscow. And then he was on a transit, uh, I think it was a train towards um, the Manchurian border. So the article is appearing in Chicago American and New York Evening Journal, Journal for example, described a hair-raising prose of mammoth famine in Ukraine, which is which it was alleged to have claimed 6 million lives in the previous year. Thomas Walker claimed to have smuggled in a camera to the Soviet Union so he could capture these so-called famine pictures. The crazy thing about these photographs is that they were proven to be hoaxes over 50 years ago. And yet they're still used today by Ukrainian nationalists and universities. Conservative or fascist orientation paper, of course, loves fake Russian horror stories. It was very popular and very common among the time. In the West Press, for example, the London Daily Telegram on November 28th, 1934 said an interview with Frank Eastman, who had just returned from Russia after a long visit, lasting seven months, would have reported witnessing bloody massacres and rows of ghastly corpses. Louis Fisher, an American writer of the New Republic and the Nation, was in Moscow in the time of the alleged atrocities, discovered that not only what had not only was had such events never occurred, but that would have never left the country almost eight months before the scenes he claimed to witness. Uh, so, once again, people are just uh, these people are just plainly lying about the time that they were there. They can't even keep the time that they were they, they were straight. Saying, so, the person said, "Oh, I was there for this many time and I saw these massacres." But truth is, they left several months before they said it had even happened. So they're saying, "No, oh, I saw this thing happen in the Soviet Union in December, but I actually left the Soviet Union in March." What the hell is that about? <clears throat> so making up stories about the Soviet Union and atrocities is nothing new which of course this was, had been happening for a long time even before the Thomas Walker stories so William Randolph Hearst the paper, the guy who owns the paper that um originally published the so-called Holodomor Thomas Walker went to. This is we're gonna talk about William Randolph Horst. So 
these are the sources, okay? So the people who try to say that Holdemar happened, these are your sources. William Randolph Horse controlled close to fifth of the American press at the time and was a fascist sympathizer. Hmm. All right, guys? Anti-communist, libertarian communist, and, and uh, um, anarchists who like to use this against, uh, so for the alt comms or whatever. The source you're using is a fascist. <laughs> Straight up. Embarrassing. He hired. No, and thing is, it's not like, you know, oh, I'm claiming he's a fascist because, you know, yeah, he's against me, whatever. No, he hired Mussolini <laughs> regularly. <laughs> All right. He paid Mussolini 10 times what he would make as the head of the sta- Italian state. All right. So Mussolini made X amount of money as he, when he was you know, the fascist dictator. Hearst paid him 10 times that to write for his paper, to write for Hearst. These are your sources, okay? In the summer of 1934, Hearst travels to Nazi Germany. And in Munich, he met with Ernst, I'm going to try to say this name, but I'm definitely going to fumble on it. So Ernst Hunstenagel, who was press officer of the Reich and close advisor to Hitler. So this, uh, this, so you know, when I say fascist sympathizer, I, I mean it. I'm not just calling him a fascist sympathizer because I feel like it. <clears throat> Hmm. Jesus. My throat's trying to hurt now. <laughs> yeah, there, um, uh, Carter Baby says, I mean, there was a famine, but it wasn't um, intentional, planned, or an executed attempt at eradicating Ukrainians, as the fascist narrative claims. No, it wasn't. There was a famine. And uh, at one point, there was a low crop yield, but even then, it wasn't even too horrible. And the reason why right, a lot of crops did go happen. bad was because... I mean, there, yeah, there's nothing... Yeah. A, poor ecological policies it. and the weather, you know, like, mm-hmm. these are not intentional, you know, to hurt people. These just things just fucking happen. Yeah. Droughts happen. Sorry, fam. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, are you going to say, but well, I mean, I guess you can say it is kind of capitalism's fault for the uh, drought in California because, I mean, it does lead up to, you know, ecological um, destruction causing, you know, and climate change, which does tie to capitalism. But, I mean, California does have droughts. You're not going to say, uh, well, it was Joe Biden that did this. Shut the fuck up. It just didn't rain. He doesn't control the weather. It'd be cool if he could. I mean, it'd be cool if I could control the weather. But he can't, so. You know, it'd be hilarious, though. If I could control the weather, I would not have it rain in Washington, D.C. No reason at all. <laughs> it wouldn't even do anything. And it would have no significance at all. People probably wouldn't even notice. But I would just have it never rain in <laughs> Washington, D.C. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about the photos that, you know, if you look up Ukrainian genocide, you're, uh, not Ukrainian genocide, Holodomor genocide, this is a, the photos here are from Walker that he uses in the paper originally. So the photos used by Walker, who supposedly took them in 31 and 32, even though he didn't get to the USSR until a couple years later, the photos, in, the photos actually date back to a 1921 publication of the actual Volga famine, during the White Army Civil War, as well as several other famines that take place out of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> so, one of the pictures of a naked boy claiming calmly posing, and in the same supposed visit village as a man suffering from cold, despite having a sheepskin coat, and some are identified from the old Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So, some of these photos are even from the Soviet Union. <laughs> I love that. And mm-hmm, one from the New York Evening Journal portrays an Austrian cavalry soldier standing next to a dead horse following World War One. He's actually got a World War One hat on. What are you trying to say? This was in the thirties. <laughs> <laughs> I 
But one is caption. Uh, so in a typical peasant's hut, dirt floor, thatch roof, and one piece of furniture, the bench was a very thin girl and had her two and a half year old brother. The youngest child crawled around the floor like a frog, and his poor little body was so deformed from lack of nourishment that it did not resemble a human being. Its mother had died when it was one year old, and this child has never tasted milk or butter, and has only tasted meat. And once again, huh? this picture doesn't take place when the supposed genocide happened. All right, and of course, you know, despite trying to say that this was a hut, you know, a peasant's hut, whatever. It was a doctor's office. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just read that. That was funny. Mm -hmm. I actually have the picture up to me so I can share it with you. Okay. Share screen. Oh. That's the picture that is used. And Hold on. Something. It's happened. not. Okay. Our video. You Is your video still on? What do you mean? So, oh, yeah, my video should still be on. Yeah, I could still see mine. Okay, hold on. Oh, wait, there it goes. Mm. Okay. <sighs> so this is the picture... It's up. Yeah, so this is okay. not a doctor's office. Yeah, so this not... is the picture that is used. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so even then, it's not even from the 30s when the supposed genocide took place. It's once again from the 1920s famine that occurred in Volga. And you can even see she's wearing a 1920s flapper hat. All right? And she looks pretty healthy. Just trying to say, oh, just thin girl. She looks fine to me. She looks annoyed to be taking the picture, but yeah, yeah, she does. I mean, otherwise, like, why would the the kid be naked unless he was like fucking at the doctor? Like, he doesn't look that great. They wouldn't just keep the baby na naked. Hmm. Yeah. It's a doctor's office. People get sick. I know, insane. And if People you have a kid, sick. you know that you you take the the clothes off of the child. At the I'm doctor. not talking about the little kid. I'm talking about the girl. Yeah, the kid is obviously sick. Yeah, the little kid is obviously sick. Yeah. So James Casey, who was an investigative reporter at the time, he wrote, Art department heads of the Hearst newspaper have been instructed to dig up old war and post war pictures from the files, pictures taken of fifteen to eighteen years ago from war war torn areas of Europe. Some of the pictures have been retouched to look new. In another case, the old pictures have been rephotographed the result of many of them look like prints. In October 1934, the Herald and Examiner, there were articles by former French Premier Eduardo Harriet, who had recently returned from traveling around Ukraine and said the whole campaign on the subject of famine in Ukraine is currently being waged. While, while wandering around Ukraine, I saw nothing of the sort. Another journalist, Lindsay Parrott, who had traveled to Ukraine in 33, and said nowhere he had seen signs of effects of a famine, and they actually had an excellent harvest in 33. So, Hearst is working close at this point now, Hearst is working closer with the Nazis and refuses to acknowledge the proof that Walker is a liar and even ignore his own correspondent in Moscow who wouldn't push a narrative. So, this person who works for the Hearst newspaper who actually is in Moscow even says, No, that's not this is not what's happening, and Hearst ignored him. <laughs> the only people who actually work for it on paper. Okay, so a few months after that, so we're still talking about. Okay, so when we're going back to the Thomas Walker here. So once again, this is the person that you guys are citing here. This is the guy, Thomas Walker. A few months after that, Walker was deported from England 
and is arrested in the U.S., it turns out Walker was an escaped Colorado convict named Robert Green. And he was and given an eight-year sentence for get this, forgery. Wait. Right, he was already sitting in jail for lying. Uh, forgery? Oh, my God. Really? Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, he was an escaped convict, and he was given an eight-year sentence for forgery. And then now he came up with this whole thing about a lot of more things. So it's just absolutely hilarious. He he was already getting jail for being a liar, and then now people are still <laughs> believing him about a lot more. It's just hilarious. It is wild, but you know it gets even worse. Because, you know, you think, well, well, this Thomas Walker guy is absolutely heroic because he's collaborating with fascists. And then he's, you know, he, he's lying about making up this whole story. But he actually becomes a worse person. And so he was found to have other convictions spanning three decades, including the Man White Slave Act in Texas, which is a law against trafficking girls across state borders for prostitution. So yeah, somehow Thomas Walker got even worse. <sighs> Jesus. And it's just absolutely mind numbing how people could still believe that what this guy has to say, that they still just take his word of mouth, this guy who is trafficking young woman who has went to jail for forgery and yet they sell you know what i still have to believe what he says about the soviet union even though he wasn't even in the soviet union at the time he claims to have genocide to have happened okay i have um a question for everyone please um look at oh shit reggie's gotten really big again Hold on, let me share the screen with you. (laughs) Okay, which one do we choose? Do we like the red one or the purple one? I just made both of these. Red one's pretty cool. (laughs) Here, let's do a poll. Okay. Please vote in that and tell us which emote you would like to see. Okay, you can continue. Excuse me. All right, see you, Gromps Torino. Thanks for being Uh, here, Gromps Torino. All right, so back to Thomas Walker and what a horrible human being he is. So the trial brought out, all right, this is the trial that Thomas Walker brought out. The trial brought out that these famine pictures were fake. All right. They were proven to be fake. All back when they first came out. And it's still used today as a fact. And nobody oh, wants shit. to really look into it. And if you Hey, do, hold on. We are fake. getting a, a raid right now from left flank, flank, left, flank, <laughs> left flank vets with 138 people. Welcome in. There left you go. Flank you got vets. it. Congratulations, <laughs> Sal. You were able to say left flank vets. God damn it. <laughs> Welcome Did I see in. it right? We are talking right. about... Uh, Holodomor, uh, the fake genocide. This is a spicy episode with a lot of receipts. So, yeah, stick around. Thanks for the raid. Yeah, you guys missed a lot of the numbers that I said earlier. So, yep. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, the trial brought out that these famine pictures were fake. All right, and the entire Holodomor story was dismissed in the American public. America, everybody, or at least most of America, knew that there, it did not happen. Hearst was a um, Hearst. Uh, Thomas Walker was a liar. 
which is so completely different today. While now we are trusting Walker, we are trusting what he has to say when most of the American public does believe a lot more happened, even though it was proven to not have happened at the time. I just want to say you guys are <clears throat> little shits because the poll is tied 12 to 12. <laughs> you guys suck. <laughs> now I have to pick. Ugh! Okay, I'll be right back. You continue talking. Thank you all, everyone, for um, following. We really appreciate that. Windchild13, um, uh, Fizzgizen, uh, Orange Grinders, etc. Uh, I'll be right back. Continue. Uh, yeah, uh, this is why democracy fails. <laughs> yeah. Making an executive decision. It's going to be red. <laughs> All right, so Hearst, uh, the owner of the paper, hires another journalist, journalist, Henry Lang, to corroborate his story. He is a right-wing, self-proclaimed socialist of the Yiddish paper, The Forward. And he had already launched his campaign against unions, and he wanted to bust workers' unions and promote strike busting because he felt like cooperating with the Limmaster that they would be able to improve their quality of life. And he's immediately denounced by the Socialist Party itself, as well as the Jewish Socialist community. After Lange is uh, is RH, another so-called source, he comes back with a picture of what he says is him talking to Russian workers in Ukraine. No, he's to Russian workers about the Ukraine famine. And it's just a picture of him with random people. There is no evidence of them talking about the supposed famine, let alone evidence of the famine itself. And the one issue with that picture of him saying that he was talking to Russian workers about the Ukrainian famine is the guy's friend who went to Ukraine with him said the story was BS because the guy couldn't even speak Russian. <laughs> so he's trying to claim that he was communicating and talking with the... Um, Russian people about the so-called Ukrainian genocide. He can't even speak Russian, so how is he supposed to be doing that? And the fact that it was his friend that said it is absolutely hilarious. <clears throat> so yes, right now I'm just going through different because uh, after the whole Thomas Walker thing blew up, um, Hearst was still set out to destroy and prove that a whole lot more was happening. So he's just just going through different people and trying to create sources, which is what is used today at the same time even then thomas walker is still kind of used in a way they don't you know explicitly see you know call out thomas walker but it's definitely reference to what he says thomas walker the fashion so center. another is mm -hmm, he is so another is Fred Beale. he wrote another book called the proletarian journey in which he uses pictures but none of them are over the famine. The story itself is extremely racist, with disgusting characters of Jewish people. In the story, there's an impossible thing. there's an impossible story of a man who starved to death with his horse. I mean Tell me, how is that supposed to happen? How are you supposed to start at the exact same time as your horse? I'm using their sources and arguments and how they can't prove it. You want me to disprove a genocide that didn't happen? Why don't you try to prove it did happen? So another source is Dr. Ewald Amende in 1935 printed a book in Nazi Germany. By the way, as I said again, these are the sources that I'm talking that that they is used today. It is from Nazis, fascists, and people who are proven to have lied about it and proven I mean, their pictures are used that aren't even of the time that it supposedly happened. So cool what happened apologia. first. <laughs> mm -hmm. So another source is Dr. Ewald Emende in 1935 printed a book in Nazi Germany entitled Try This Again, but I cannot promise you I will pronounce it correctly. Mersuland Hunargen, Hun Hun uh, and in 1936 was published in the U.S. as Human Life in Russia, 
which would be republished in 84. So this book, Nazi, wait, this is a book from Nazi Germany, a propaganda book from Nazi Germany. It's republished in the U.S. in 36 and again in 84. These are your references, people. So it references Andrew Smith and, and Harry Lange, which we've already um, shown that he um, wasn't telling the truth. <laughs> that, you know, he was already disproven when he was very anti-communist. Um, he was very anti-workers. So he uses Nazi press, Mussolini press, as well as immigrant Ukrainian nationalists. Travelers and experts are cited, but are never named. So these, you can, I can easily say, oh, I have proof of evidence of this because this is what people tell me, but I'm not going to tell you their names. I'm not going to show you that these people even so much as exist. But trust me, they are out there and they did tell me what happened. Trust me, bro. Just trust me, bro. Huh? So there are no source. There are no new sources at all, all right? So after Walker, they, there is no new sources. They're just saying stuff now. They're just saying, "Oh yeah, this is uh, what happened." But it's always going back to Thomas Walker. They always keep on referencing Thomas Walker, but they can't say it because he's already been this to be proven wrong. So there. Are, um, so he uses the Thomas um, Walker photos again. But because he had already been debunked, he claimed they were by a Austrian specialist. Sorry. Let's not talk about Fred Beale here. And so he does the frog child story again, but instead of crediting Walker, he credits Walker. <laughs> because he used a 1934 London Daily Express story, which is written under one of Walker's names. And I guess since you know a lot of not a lot of people knew that it was Walker's name, so they didn't realize that he was still citing Thomas Walker, which has <laughs> already been proven that Thomas Walker was full of bullshit. But because you know you use a different name, uh, since he used a different name, people don't realize that it was still Thomas Walker, a completely bullshit. So now we have reached the point where they are citing each other over and over and over again, but it all still leads to Walker who, as we said, is already debunked. They just didn't cite him because they couldn't. There are no new sources of the Ukrainian genocide. It all seems legitimate because you... It all seems legitimate because you see mountains of citations of sources. But if you took the time and, it's like, just, you know, sit exactly through them... It's exactly like the fucking Adrian Zen's business, you know? Hmm? It just feels just... Yeah. Just like that. Okay, continue. Sorry. Yeah, you know... It, if you took the time and saw who these people were citing and then who they were citing and who this book was citing and that all back to already debunked claims. So for a while, the story tries to you know, gain traction, but it dies until the end of world war two. You can get any of what happened. What happened after world war two? What happened? Tell me, I need the chat to tell me what happened after world war two. Come and on, why the story was suddenly, Show us your noggins, your thinking parts. I'm definitely using this next as an excuse to drink water. <laughs> Damn, chat can't think. Sorry, <laughs> <clears throat> but since I need to tell you guys, apparently, <laughs> after World War II was over. And there was a sudden wave of Nazis and Ukrainian fascists that flooded into the U.S. and Canada. Operation Paperclip is a go. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's why the Ukrainian um, Ukrainian um, Holodomor story was able to pick up traction again. So the U.S. Office of Policy Coordination and, and uh, petitioned the U.S. state saying that these Ukrainian nationalists weren't actually Nazis. So, where they weren't actually Nazis, they said they. Um, so this is still what um, the um, U.S. Poly coordination is saying right now. So they said that they actually fought against the Nazis because they didn't want the Nazis to take Ukraine. Which I mean, 
I don't know if they uh, Ukrainian nationalists actually did do that, but this is what the Ukraine, but this is what the um, Office of Policy Coordination is claiming they um, they did. And I mean, they very much could have uh, Ukrainian um, nationalists could, you know, they be extremely nationalists. They just don't they don't want to be part of Nazi Germany. They could have been wanting to do their own thing. They just like, hey, let's work together, but do not come over here. But it doesn't change the fact that there were still, you know. There were still Nazi collaborators, and they were still fascists. At the end, but uh, they were still Ukrainian nationalists, and so they were paraded as heroes who fought the Nazis and Bolsheviks. So they had to be on our side, and because of this, the U.S. State Department allows a wave of Ukrainian nationalists into the U.S. Mm-hmm. Most networks, yes. Okay, so the reason why I'm stopped talking every now and then is because I'm reading the chat, just so um, so the people know. You're good. Mm-hmm. So when the Ukrainian nationalists um, came flooding into the U.S., they were redirected into the American Committee of Liberation from Bolshevism, which is also known as Radio Liberty. And receives ninety percent of its budget from the CIA. <laughs> love it, you love so, it. Great job, America. <laughs> so, at the same time as the Ukrainian nationalists were being funneled throughout the U.S. State Department, the U.S. doesn't allow anyone into the U.S. from Eastern Europe countries if they were ever a member of the Communist Party. Which they still do that policy today. They they mm-hmm. they ask you on like when you come in and they like literally won't let you come (laughs) (laughs) so yeah that's cool yeah you can definitely see the two sides of things they were having Ukrainian nationalists funneling them throughout the entire state department while they weren't allowing people who were a member of the communist party even into the country so, yeah, you know, we are truly getting an unbiased opinion on what happened. <clears throat> okay, so Robert Conklin was a former British Secret Service agent. So, you know, at least now we have someone who isn't American. So, thank God. This person's British. So, Robert Conklin was a former British Secret Service agent who worked in the Information Research Department, was asked to write a book on the famine, which was entitled Harvest of Sorrow. Uh, so uh, a guy named Prager, and it's not the guy who it's not Dennis Prager, so but Prager Pugh. big coincidence, <laughs> big coincidence if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Good night, lazy pajamas. <laughs> it was definitely Dennis. I didn't see a name, so, <laughs> but I highly doubt it. <laughs> So Prager, who was uh, a publisher, published these books at the CIA's request. And in this book, Kotkin ups his early prediction from say, 6 million to 14 million. So he, he just, you know, I just says, oh, just decided, it, well, yeah, it wasn't 6 million people, it was just 14 million. He just decided to make a random decision. So he extends, and not only that, but he decides to change, um, change the dates for the famine. He extended the date from the famine of, from, from to 1937. Instead of thirty-three, so yeah, so the Walker story was you know thirty-five, thirty-three, and he extends it to thirty-seven, and to line up with the cr- low crop yield and Petro Pavlovich. Oh yeah, and another thing he does is move it back from thirty-five to thirty-three. My bad. So it could actually you know because there was a low crop yield and that's the best they can do because <clears throat> they're idiots, all of them. They're all liars. So uh, Petro Pavlovich wrote a, also wrote a book in where he cites a mass grave as evidence of the Holodomor, but it was actually a mass grave of Jewish SS and Ukrainian militia victims. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Ukrainian nationalists are touting this mass grave as proof of the evil Bolsheviks, when in reality they were the victims of Ukrainian fascists. Mm-hmm. 
Lobby. Lobby. Sweaty. I'm sorry, but you're you're not gonna be able to to win this one. You're you're just factually wrong. <laughs> yeah, because I I don't see any of the things you said, but I'm pretty sure everything you're talking about, I've already talked about a, a while ago and you just didn't see it. Maybe. <clears throat> Maybe you just weren't listening to me because I don't know. Your choice is your choice. So a source for the famine numbers comes from Dr. Horsley Grant, who claims the figures is 15 million, which would mean 60% of the population was just wiped out and nobody noticed. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, just, just try to comprehend that. They're trying to convince us that 60% of the population was just wiped out and nobody even noticed a thing. It was just one after day. 60% of the population is gone. How much is 60% of the American population? Can someone in the chat do the math here? I'd be grateful. I think the population is like 300 million. And so I just want to see, you know, for, you know, reference. Mm, if 175 million people? people? Like a hundred. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, like, yeah, 175 million. Just imagine 175 million people. They're trying to convince you that 120, let's say 175 million people in America just just died and nobody noticed. I feel like, you know, that's a pretty big thing to see happen. <clears throat> so, the next one to come out is in the 80s. It was called 50 Years Ago by Walter Disnick, who also was also the editor of a Ukraine, a concise encyclopedia, which he did with a Nazi collaborator. He tries to legitimize the numbers by using census numbers from the 1926 census and the 1939 census and averages out the increase pre-collectivization and post and said it is calculated that Ukraine lost 7.5 million. A U.S. sociologist in response says this, this math assumes that one even in conditions of extreme famine, instability, and civil war, the peasants would conceive at the same rate as in less precarious periods. Two, that abortion and infanticide did not increase and that there have been, there was many women of maximum reproductive age in 1932. This also doesn't take into account that the fact that the civil war and World War II, there were massive birth gaps. So, they try to use this as, as evidence, you know, of the people this population is not increasing as it should be. Which is a ridiculous thing to, ridic- ridiculous way of saying things because um, just before the first, before the, in 1926 or during 1926, they were, they're in the middle of a, a, of a civil war here. People are not having children. <laughs> <laughs> Why would they have children? Uh, you know, it's crazy, right? There's a civil war, and then there is a famine, and then guess what? World War II. It's not a great time to just be popping out children, okay? <laughs> it's going to be low birth rates. And of course, you know, the uh, the women in these, um, the, 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 as a woman, had their own ways of birth control. That is their choice. And so, yeah, they try to um, say, oh, because <clears throat> that since um, there wasn't really that much of an increase and the birth rates are so different um, from this time to this time, it means that there was a genocide there. No, it just means people didn't have children. And yes, yeah, so <clears throat> there is, of course, a whole lot more, but that would have went on forever and ever. So I do recommend that you Get the book yourself, Fraud, Famine, and Fascism. I'm going to see if I could find a copy of it and share it into the chat. Because I believe everybody should definitely um, read it yourself. It is a heavy read, but a good read nonetheless. And we just find it. There is one more thing I want to do before we go. Um... I want mm-hmm. us to go over second thought, just put out a video 
and they were talking about revolutionary optimism, which I believe is a Marxist Leninist Maoist uh, like term. So I wanted to just see what's happening with old buddy's second thought. I didn't hear it. What happened? Um, okay, so um, s do you know who Second Thought is? Nope. Okay, Second Thought is a content creator who talks about capitalism and like tries to teach about class consciousness. Um, but they just had a video that dropped yesterday, and it was talking about the necessity for revolutionary optimism, which is a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist term right revolutionary op optimism didn't that come from gonzalo uh yeah he gonzalo did talk about it a lot um, so i mean yeah, it I was can just... be attributed to marxist i don't know if that was, but yeah um it definitely is um you, you definitely see a lot of Maoists talking about revolutionary optimism we definitely do push it a lot so uh yeah but before this he wasn't really like doing anything uh like kind of letting I don't know. He he was always he's been anti capitalist. Anyways, it's like five minutes or, or ten minutes probably. Uh do you care if we watch it and go over it really quick? Before we go? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Yes. Oh so oh, you already posted a link to the PDF earlier? Cool. Yeah. Oh I can do it again though. Okay, yeah. I and saw this. Already video, copied I the like, okay, thing. Cool. Here is a hard copy of it. <laughs> okay. Oh, what? That's not one that I have. Here we go. Yeah, I was just like, oh, this is interesting. Let's see what. Let's see what he's talking about. Um. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Let me know when you're ready. I actually really did enjoy doing the research for this. I definitely don't want to <clears throat> do another thing again soon. Probably over Harry Haywood. Oh, yeah. I'm going to... Mm -hmm. But, no, that's a really big book. So, that's at a... Oh, going to be a while before I actually have something for that. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel and get early access to every video, to imagine ourselves as living through good times, where once the future was brimming with hope and we were free to imagine a utopian society for ourselves and our children, pessimism has steadily crept over our imagination, taking hold of our future and shackling us with a vision of dystopia. We've become accustomed to the idea that things won't actually get better, and it's not all that surprising. Every day we're confronted with these narratives, not just in movies or TV shows, but in our day-to-day -day life too. We watch from the sidelines as proto-fascist regimes grow in power and popularity. Right in front of us, the institutions of our governments are taken over by those who repress our civil liberties while the state's forces descend into our streets and punish our resistance with violence. We see white nationalism, the very kind uh, we had yeah, been told would fade away in our ever-progressing society, swell- What did you say, Reggie? No, um, uh, somebody asked if I was talking about Black Bolshevik, and yeah, I was. Oh, yeah, okay. When I'm talking about, um, Perry Haywood. Into podium squids. Well, and become more indiscriminate in its cruelty. Year after year, report after report confirms the enormous toll that our reliance on fossil fuels has on our environment and our health, promising escalation as long as we keep going with business as usual. And all the while, in the background, the machine keeps turning and pushing more and more people into poverty, into sickness, and into endless menial work. These past couple of years, and really the past couple decades, have not been easy. And although this introduction has painted a grim picture of our society, in this episode, we'll be focusing on its antidote, revolutionary optimism. Both holding onto optimism as a revolutionary act in itself, and the necessity of optimism in working towards positive change. Let's jump in. Revolutionary optimism is several things. For one, it's the rejection of a defeatist or doomer outlook on life. Revolutionary optimism means remaining hopeful that the goals of the revolution will one day be achieved, and that these causes are worth fighting for, day in and day out. 
What revolutionary optimism is not is a blind faith in the success of this. Uh, so someone asks, is this channel third worldist? No, we're not. Uh, no, we are, we are not third worldist. Um, the third, I mean, of course, there's different terms for third worldism again, but from what I um, heard about third worldism, worldism is that the first world, um, which is us people living in America, Canada, uh, UK, and stuff like that, um, they don't. Third worldists don't believe that we have any revolutionary potential. That it's impossible for us to be, have a revolution. Which, no, uh, we can't have one. Struggle. It is not falling into dogma and blindly assuming that the end of an unjust and capitalist system is inevitable. And by that assumption, standing back as it continues to reproduce both injustice and capitalism itself. Revolutionary optimism is active. But we should start with the flip side of the coin, despair. Despair, pessimism, or more recently, doomerism, is one of our greatest modern challenges. Whatever you want to call it, it seems that more and more people are feeling it and have given up, either on their own personal success or that of the climate movement, the most existential struggle in the history of our species. Other times, doomerism comes from the ranks of the left, where doomers are convinced in the failure of a socialist future or the impossibility of wishing for a time where large-scale issues like racial inequality will be resolved. There is something understandable about this point of view given the magnitude of these issues. That being said, there is also something deeply wrong with doomerism. This mindset stops progress dead in its tracks. We can see this in every progressive movement. After all, doomerism justifies disengaging politically in protest. I'm totally fine with answering them. Just yeah, I, I they felt the need just in case people don't know what third worldism is that they you know they, so they can know what third worldism is and why I don't subscribe to it. And why it's just wrong, you know. Yeah, there is revolutionary potential, even though it may not feel like it in the first world. You know, we can't have a revolution, and it does feel people who are third worldists. It does feel like that they are kind of like a lazy taking a point. That you know, hey, why bother? Because mm -hmm. we can't have a revolution here anyway. We're in the first world. Yeah, yeah, that's just not even like a good way to think. Like, why would you? Why would you do that? Yeah or elections, allowing more committed then, political so yes, opponents to I'm define a, the political yeah, sphere to I'm a mouse, so yes. <laughs> their benefit, willfully ignoring or amplifying the very issues that plunge people into doomerism in the first place. We see this in government explicitly, where politicians take advantage of defeatist narratives in an even more detrimental way as they completely resign on tackling big issues. Before a piece of progressive legislation is even considered by Congress, we have seen time and time again our elected officials giving up on it as if it were dead on arrival instead of treating it properly, like the product of a political will they have the power to influence and the responsibility as representatives to see it through. We've seen this with the $15 minimum wage, we've seen it with the Green New Deal, and we'll continue to see it so long as there is a resignation to fatalism on the left. Before these bills ever made it to the Capitol, Democratic leadership admitted defeat, uh, not so seeking to counter the, conservative the narratives. Realism, I do see it being attributed to Maoists, but a lot of people who do call themselves Maoists and claim to be third worldists, they don't really act like it. They do, um, they take a, okay, so I believe it was a Swiss Maoists, I, I think, Maoists or whatever. They, they are third worldists. I can't remember the country. I think it was the Swiss, they were, um, but yeah, they, they 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 aren't trying to, you know, bring up the revolutionary potential in the Swiss people. They're just being adventurous, and which is goes against what Maoists believe. So it's weird to call yourself a Maoist and be also third worldist. And bureaucratic obstacles with the same vigor their opponents do. This should be obvious. But the more we prematurely give up and tell ourselves it'll never happen, the more likely failure becomes. And this turns out great for those who want to see progress stunted. For a fossil fuel executive, there is no difference between a denialist and a doomer. Whether you don't support measures to reduce the effects of climate change because you've given up, or because you don't believe in the problem at all, 
It's all the same for those who profit off the continued emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and the pollution of our local environments. But of course, doomerism doesn't come out of nowhere. There is an explanation. Behind this fashionable internet term is often simply another form of depression. This deep-seated feeling of despair brought about by converging social and societal factors can be less a political philosophy and more of an illness that affects many of us. We know from 2020 and 2021, during which we saw a 30% increase in feelings of depression and anxiety and a 45% increase in deaths of despair, that this is affecting more and more people and that it is largely a product of our collective environment. It would hardly be productive for us to single out those for whom this is a well-known issue and pretend like it is them who are somehow to blame for the stagnation of American politics or the difficult journey towards a more sustainable future. Instead, it is imperative to counter the narratives that emerge out of doomerism with what is lacking, a sense of agency and optimism. And there are reasons to be optimistic. For starters, more and more people today are mobilizing for a better future. People are taking up protest signs, spots in elected office, and roles in society to both promote and actively bring about positive change on a scale that hasn't been seen for several decades. Last year, city streets swelled with massive crowds the world over, with people advocating for a more equal society and the end to our dependency on fossil fuels. On the left specifically, we've seen a massive surge in political awareness and support for the socialist cause. But if you find yourself falling into the doom and gloom mindset, you likely already know this and think it's not enough. But don't worry, there's more and there are things that you can do. For one thing, acknowledge that this isn't your fault. Plenty of people are falling into this sense of general malaise and there is objective proof that this is a product of our circumstances and the specific conditions most of us live in today. Second, while this all seems so Sarah permanent, the odds are on our side. They're on the side of progress. For climate change specifically, we're kicking fossil fuels out of energy production at rates we never expected 20 to 30 years ago. In some countries, like Scotland, renewables make up almost the entirety of energy production at 97%, a recent development that would have seemed unimaginable a generation ago. In global south countries like China, where renewables are still a comparatively costly option, an ever greater portion of electricity is coming from less polluting sources. Just recently, China declared that it would cease all funding for new coal plants, doing more for the climate movement with the stroke of a pen Monroe, than cool. decades of, of unproductive Western right, summits. While it may often seem like our current moment in history is part of this long lineage, an unbreakable string of events. Oh my God. This emote is so freaking cute. $27. Nice. It's a, it's a <laughs> <laughs> comrade unicorn. We exist in a very new time that can just as easily transform into something different. Like Ursula K. Le Guin said, though we live in capitalism and its power seems inescapable, so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. We have far more agency than we often feel like we do. In a human history of 200,000 years, our current economic model has only prevailed for the past 500, our current conditions for less than a century, and our ability to change them has never been so great. As a final consideration, think about the ways that you can get involved to make this change happen. The best antidote to feeling that nothing is changing isn't listening to a couple statistics. It's actually working something. to make things change yourself. It's hardly a new idea that action is a remedy to despair. But we don't need particularly novel ideas for things to improve. If you're looking for an easy way to get started, there is always going to be an organization or group nearby making meaningful change in your community. In just about every major city and most other places around the country, you'll find a local branch of the DSA, a socialist or communist political party, or your local community's mutual aid collective. And yes, for those of you who like to complain about the DSA and claim it's a sham, I'm going to continue including it because it's always better to get involved and learn the ropes of organizing than it is to call everything an op. No, it's obviously not perfect. Yes, some branches are way too liberal, but it's a democratic organization. If you want it to become more radical, get involved and not. work to make it happen. Or at the very least, <laughs> attend a meeting, confirm it's not for you, and then you'll know you're not missing out on anything. 
If none of these groups are options in your area, there will still always be some place looking for help or be some way that you can leverage your skills to make a positive difference. If you can cook, you can participate in efforts to feed the homeless or those demonstrating at sit-ins, protests, and strikes. If you're an artist, you can create posters and flyers for a local group or just to promote socialist ideas. If you're a writer, write for whatever audience you can get. It's never been easier to host your work online. Same thing if you're a speaker. If you have medical or first aid skills, help out when protesters are injured. If you can edit videos, make your own channel. I started with zero subscribers, a computer, and some opinions. Anything is possible. If you feel lost, Yo, Sal, start reading stream. and learn about what other people have done. <laughs> that would be cool. We should think about that. Either on your own yeah. or in book clubs or online communities. <laughs> Participate in the movements you see spring up around you. Speak at local government meetings. Elect local <laughs> leaders that better represent you or run yourself. If you can find even one thing that makes sense for you to do, do it. At the end of the day, the message behind maintaining a revolutionary optimism isn't committing to taking up arms or immediately overthrowing a government you disagree with. It's about maintaining a consistent and continuous vision of resistance against capitalist decline within a framework of solidarity and community. Okay, I'm gonna have to disagree with you there. Uh, but, yeah. Um, I mean, it is not immediately doing that, but it is, you know getting organized so we can it's a start <sighs> i mean it's not, you know it's not you know perfectly what we want but <sighs> yeah at some point you know you just you know you, this is the only doomer part of me you guys are ever gonna see but you know it's hard to really get too upset about it like you know what at least you know if something is happening it, it is the, it is the beginning so maybe that is not doomer i don't know what i'm talking about it is the beginning and I, you I've know so i feel like uh the 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 action that we've seen within like the labor movements you know around the united states that we went over yesterday um people are organizing and that is the the best thing that we can do is we can all uh, find people with, you know, uh, ideas like ours and build these connections so that we have power to, you know, fucking halt production and make them listen. And then if they don't listen to that, then we move forward, you know, because power concedes them. nothing without a fight you know they're not just going to be like okay you win we'll just give you this stuff and stop taking from you you know needlessly they're, they're not going to do that so once you get on like that boat you get on the boat here with us uh, then that's when we can do the damn thing you know a revolution is not measured by the moment a government or economic system falls, but rather by the efforts of a united community. And that takes time, people, and hope to build. Yes. If this feels oversimplified, that's because it is. Of course, telling you to make posters isn't going to suddenly end climate change or resolve any of the awful situations we found ourselves in. In the same way that no video will ever perfectly speak to your circumstances or what you can do, or even completely capture something as vague as revolutionary optimism, this is only a first and you deeply personal say, step. The goal. Oh, I'm a tank. Yeah, I'm a tanky. Yeah, I'm a tanky. <laughs> We're riding that tank, <laughs> mowing down the fucking tank. snowflakes. Bless you. Thank you. So, what were you saying, Regime? There's a pretty good YouTube channel called Prol Cult. It is a P R O L E K U L T. Nice. It's pretty good. In these suggestions and the future. Yeah, yeah, we can do like a like a react thing with like more of these or whatever. I don't know. The critique of Doomer narratives yeah. isn't to give you all the keys, but to participate in the cultivation of a culture of positive action. <laughs> this is the only way forward. If we look to the past, positive determination and commitment to change hey, has always been the only way to achieve hey. progress. Every social movement hey. has relied on positivity, <laughs> not naive idealism or the misplaced belief that society is further along than it really is, 
but a genuine desire to push forward and strive for positive change. Baked into the very idea of a movement for change is the feeling that there is hope. For a movement to exist, it must both realize the inadequacy and injustice of the present, but also believe in the ability for this to change into a better future. That is inherently optimistic. Otherwise, why create a movement at all? On the pragmatic level, social organizers have known the importance of optimism for a long time. If their project doesn't seem exciting, driven by enthusiastic people, or reasonably likely to succeed, people won't join, and why would they? Part of the reason one of the suggestions in this video is to join a local organization is because collectives create self-reinforcing visions of hope and optimism. When a collective properly uses hope to set itself goals, both you as the member and the organization as a whole are pushed forward towards social change. Hope becomes much more tangible, hey, and therefore the so does the chance of a difference you. actually being made. If you're still Point unconvinced, purpose. start Point reading about past revolutions, present social movements, and the central role played by revolutionary optimism and hope. As always, the sources for this video, including an academic paper that details the importance of group-based hope for environmental action, are in the description. This is not an optimism meant to distract you from everything that has gone wrong, and the legitimate fears you may have about the future. This is not a justification for complacency. This is active change. It is solidarity in response to toxic hyper-individualism. The future is ours to determine. We have a world to win, but it will take dedication, hard work, and revolutionary optimism. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of- Okay, so um, there, I, I just wanna be clear with you all that not all communists believe the same thing, okay? Um, so Marxist Leninists believe in um, actually existing socialism um, and they support um, like China and Vietnam and Cuba and uphold them as actually existing examples of socialism. Um, and uh, the people that you're talking about who do not support land back are um, are not actually uh, communists at all they are they are fascists pretending to be communists calling themselves communists maybe even thinking that they are communist but um no they are western chauvinists and bigots and um there is no social conservatism there is bigotry okay so the haas infrared group they are not an example of communists that uh, at all they're just not an example um yeah uh but land back we support land back here um there are different ways of going about like some people the the land reform thing that was being championed you know they did do land reform in many other places but here we're we're doing land back because that's what that's what they want so you know, yeah. and, you know, the colonizers do not get to dictate the terms of decolonization. OK, so that's important to remember. Right. Self-determination of indigenous people and um, native people is like the most important part. So of like supporting indigenous people their self-determination <sighs> land back is supported here yeah sorry that's just was answering this stuff happening in the chat but yeah we're, we're yeah, not all the same mean, and uh, we don't I believe, all yeah. believe the same shit <laughs> but go ahead yeah <clears throat> i believe in tibet that was like a <laughs> pretty much a slave society or like, you know, an indentured servitude. And then so China liberated those people from indentured servitude, which believe the Dalai Lama supported. So you can just say Tibet all you want. Land back's connection to Amazon. I think that like somebody got like a donation and uh, uh, now they're like people are like they're completely funded by Amazon land back is a fucking op and to that I say shut the fuck up no shut up we hate you 
<laughs> Shut the fuck up, bitch. Uh, Your opinion is not wanted. Yeah, your opinion is trash. It's a stupid opinion. All right. Hope you go to sleep at night knowing that we, two people you're probably never going to see again, think your opinion's stupid. <laughs> well, you may see us again if you come back, but who knows? Uh, I don't even know who I'm talking to. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, who's on right now? Let's see. Um, okay, so what do we have Monday? Uh, Monday, uh, Chairman Kooks, who is a wonderfully brilliant person, is going to be talking about so smart. on contradiction. Um, yeah, so definitely tune in to that. That's going to be kick ass. Um, and we're going to actually, this coming up week, we yes. are going to focus on viewer requests. Hey, thanks, Jake. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're gonna, yeah you know, because you guys have been putting some stuff into stream suggestions and we haven't really looked at them. And sorry about that, because that was a whole point of the stream suggestions um, tab. Let's actually listen to what you guys want to listen to it and hear about. So, yeah. Yeah, and we're going to do uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Who's we're on? Is there anyone you. cute on not that we anymore. can go to? <sighs> Famous horse. I think I've seen them before. Hmm. Clydeson, bread crochets. Let's see what everyone's doing. Uh, RZNWA. Ooh, I haven't seen these guys in a long time. L on here is not. Who is that? That's a, oh, that's his wife. That's his wife. She got she got her shit all Britished up. You know, <laughs> low key. I I love that that British chav look. That they, that project look. I think it's cool. Okay, uh, so RZNWA is, um, for the females. A hit, they do history, you know, pan-Africanism, you know? communism, and culture. Like that and be slick. I think they that sounds do. nice. Italians, though. We Should talked we about see? this, dude. They Hello. smacked out on South Italy. Oh, hey, hey Castle Lady 492, thank you so much. What do you think? Yes? Yes, absolutely. Cool. Let's go. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. We appreciate you spending your time here with us and learning with us and sharing your thoughts with us we fucking love it um do come back on monday uh do we have the discord out okay you have the discord you have the twitter you have the all of our bullshit okay cool we love you bye yes. okay let's see Police! Hold it right there! Come on! Don't shoot! I surrender. We're not gonna shoot you! We wanna re-educate you! You see, son? You're just the product of an alienated economic class, lashing out because you feel powerless and unloved. You've been disenfranchised by the bourgeois power structure. That's right! I stole a car. I'm a thief. Well, son, if you think about it, all property is theft. <laughs>